Okay, so uh, very glad to be uh, uh, presenting our research here today. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, start off with some questions here. Uh, you know, ladies love makeup products and this industry has been booming uh, thanks to millions of online influencers and Instagrammers, social media stars who have multiple channels uh, focusing on how to do makeup and look beautiful. But that's an end product that we buy, isn't it? Uh, if I were to ask you, uh, what do you think about the key ingredients that's gone in into your lipsticks that helps you sparkle? Or furthermore, if I'm going to ask you, uh, do you even know who made a sparkle? Would that make you give it a rethought? What if I was to say that possibly one of these children you see here in the images make us glow? The product that creates this glow, the shimmer, is mica. Mica is a naturally occurring mineral commonly used in cosmetics uh, to add shimmer to makeup. It has a wide range of applications in many different industries due to its diverse optical, functional, and both electrical and thermal insulation properties. Uh, in automotive paints, for example, and coatings, mica creates this kind of a visual effect but the seemingly harmless ingredient has been linked to child labor in India, specifically in impoverished states of Charkhand and Bihar, where children as young as five years um, have been reported working in these mica mines. It is estimated that 22,000 children work in the mica mines in Charkhand and Bihar, but these are mines that employ children and they do not report. So I think it is very hard to give the exact numbers here. Now, I'm sure some of you have come through these uh, articles uh, at the very beginning of this year. Rihanna's company Fenty Beauty uh, was accused of sourcing my, my car from Jharkhand and the Legal Rights Observatory uh, filed a complaint to seek and investigate from the uh, National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. Uh, NCPCR on the uh, source of Fenty's bu uh, beauty mica. Where are they sourcing it from? Uh, they failed to do so. Guardian has also covered such many incidents and sent stories, and so has other news media. By 2020, the UN aims to eliminate child labor, a practice that affects roughly 10% of the world's children and severely impedes sustainable development goals. SDG target 8.7 calls on to take immediate and effective measures to eradicate all forms of child labor as an essential step to achieving decent work for all. The aim of this ILO convention uh, number 138 on minimum age is the effective abolition of child labor. And they require countries to establish a minimum age for entry into work on employment. And second, to establish national policies for the elimination of child labor. It doesn't seem very promising, unfortunately. According to a 2017 ILO report, global estimates of child labor amount to a total of 152 million children, and nearly half of that, 73 million children, are in hazardous work, and that directly endangers their health, safety, and moral development. Welcome to a presentation on examining modern slavery and child slave labor in GVCs, corporate responsibility and the Indian mica mining industry. We have been working on some time now on this very important issue in the discipline of business management, an issue which has been often overlooked for many years by organizations, governments, policymakers, consumers, suppliers, all of us actually. It is a challenging and sensitive piece of work and would greatly benefit from all your comments and suggestions today. Uh, we are still very new to this area of study and we're trying to understand the complexities of this topic and the industry. Now, there is a growing concern that firms uh, moving to higher value activities in GVCs with improved technology, knowledge and skills is no longer sufficient for sustainable CSR in global supply chains, giving accumulating evidence and recent exposure that child labor in many export oriented clusters, they're all located in developing countries. Uh, you know, research by Thompson and Lynn Green in 2014, uh, uh, Lund, Thompson, and Nadvi did a study in 2010. They have uh, indicated such, uh, you know, such uh, evidences in their study. The globalization of production is blamed for contributing to modern slavery and child labor and can potentially deepen a country's comparative advantage into sectors that intensively use child labor. 
A 2019 report by the ILO under the Alliance 8.5 uses input-output tables to calculate the share of child labor present in each region and embedded in their exports. So the figures vary from 9% in Northern Africa and Western Asia to 26% in Eastern and Southeastern Asia, raising awareness of the known negligible risk that some child labor is indeed contributing to the GVCs. Now, in the context of the Global South, the literature on modern slavery and its ties to the worst form of child labor in GVCs, it provides very limited insights from management and organizational perspective. It primarily focuses on the victims, whilst the organization's involvement in exploitation and trafficking has received scant attention, according to a study done by Laxo in uh, 2005. Now, this creates a gap in conceptualizing how macro level, and that's what the chart here depicts, it actually has this, uh, you know, it, it creates a gap in conceptualizing how macro level societal structure or social structures that are created by and consists of multiple actors, including businesses, enable micro organization level capabilities, paving way to deploy child labor, uh, child slave labor rather in this case in GVCs. Micro organizational level capabilities take advantage of the macro institutional conditions that permits the practice of child labor to flourish in the face of widespread illegality, illegitimacy in the Indian mica mining industry. Uh, to the extent in which implementation of legislative and regulatory framework has not has much any positive effects on the ways in which companies address child labor and regulatory bodies, which in turn, they hold companies accountable for their involvement in it. So the blaming and shaming game has been on forever. Multiple research and studies conducted have exposed this dark side of businesses. For example, study by ILO, the Reuters uh, who have come up with multiple reports, uh, there are some government reports from NCPCR. They all indicate how the presence of the MICA sector has been on a rapid growth in the Indian states of Jharkhand and Bihar, mostly due to the increase in demand for MICA globally, engaging more and more local families from very low uh, economic background into this flourishing business. And among them, they bring their children. To understand why an organ uh, and how organizations employ child labor in the GVCs, we examine the key drivers of child labor by identifying the key macro level conditions that enables child labor. We explore the relationships between GVCs and corporate responsibility in the context of child labor, outlining the features and conceptual underpinnings of child labor in GVCs. We examine the role of organizations coming from management perspective since demand drives production, our study identifies the industries, including the cosmetics, electronics, and automotive sectors that are most significant users of MICA, drawing attention to both the supply side and the demand in the global MICA market. The Northeast Indian MICA mining industry, which is clustered around Jharkhand and Bihar, is a major manufacturing hub, can, accounting for around 75% of all MICA exports from India, and 25% of the world's total production goes in from here. Now, mica mining is an important source of income for hundreds of villages in the state of Jharkhand and Bihar. Approximately 300 villages in the state of uh, Jharkhand and Bihar, home to the world's largest mica mining area, they're all involved in this kind of illegal artisanal uh, small uh, scale mi mining. Most of the mining has been illegal in these two states and the mining licenses, central governments, Forest Conservation Act of 1980, and have often not been renewed by companies. In spite of that, they continue to function here. The market of mica has grown rapidly over the years, and definitely it goes back to, as I said, women's, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, makeup thing that has taken such a large scale uh, Instagrammers, you look at them, I, I, multiple amount of just how to do makeup and how to look beautiful. So in the, look at the cosmetic industry, how big it has grown in the last few years time. Uh, and, you know, living in Dubai and UAE, I can tell you about that, you know. So, but India's export industry, in spite of all this, has remained unregulated. It's a red flagged country actually till now. So the mining entails more than just collecting pieces of mica from the ground. 
and there is explosive, there are air compressed hammers, which are all often used to crush the rocks and dangerous and underground holes are dug to access mica for better quality. Children working in these mines are absolutely child slave labor. So that's one part we want to establish in this chapter. They are not child workers, they are child slave laborers. Since they engage in the most inhuman and dangerous working conditions, work in slavery-like conditions, and one can find them working in the worst forms of labor. Mining, according to ILO convention number 138, mining is an example of work that is hazardous by its nature. Children should not work in mines under any circumstances, but seldom have companies publicly acknowledge the use or extent of child uh, slave labor. One of the reasons is the complexities associated with the poor understanding of the term child slave labor. Now I'm going to come back to that uh, after this slide, uh, slide to explain a bit more on that. Now definitions provided by ILO, for example, they're very limiting and does not provide a clear understanding of children living in slavery, like working conditions, such as contract slavery. They don't cover that in their definitions. Uh, debt bonded slavery. GVCs operate under multiple legal and cultural value system and child labor can appear in various forms in GVCs, which makes its identification more challenging. This requires an understanding of local context. We draw attention to the limitations of this global discourse on modern slavery in addressing child labor in the Indian context that currently does not consider these kind of local variation, stressing on the need for theorizing the issue from more regional literature and to understand this historical and social cultural context of this whole, you know, not only economic inequality, but the social and cultural inequality and exploitation as well. And I will cover this bit, as I said, a bit more in the next slide. So how have companies responded so far? Now, you know, multiple companies have taken different routes to address these problems. Uh, one of them is basically uh, completely boycotting MICA. You know, so Lush has done that basically. They said, we don't engage in MICA. We have got, so if you look at Lush's website, they have got something called more sustainable products and they are branding it as uh, green uh, makeup products. Uh, so those kind of things uh, that Lush has done and they say have completely boycotted MICA. Now, on the other hand, some companies such as Steel Order, uh, L'Oreal, uh, Rocha, they have taken a more midway. They have created child-friendly villages there. So this model, it was established in 2010 as a joint initiative between the National Resources Stewardship Council, a nonprofit promoting responsible sourcing and Indian uh, NGO Bachpan, uh, Bachao Andolan, which is Kailash Satyarthi's uh, foundation. And this scheme aims to get children in 500 villages in the region into school instead of mining by working with local communities and governments to improve educational infrastructure and living conditions. Now, another method that some companies have used is called the tracking and tracing uh, methods, which has been deployed by companies such as L'Oreal. So what they do is they own, of course, uh, Body Shop, Maybelline, Merck. These are all L'Oreal's, uh, you know, their own companies. And they have committed to sourcing only from legal and fenced mines, they say. So thereby avoiding the informal sector where the child labor problem is more prevalent. What are the challenges? Is this good enough? What companies are doing? Well, the challenges are immense, very hard and very difficult ones. Reason for child labor in mica mines that has attributed to, uh, has always been attributed. If you look at any of the ILO reports, if you look at any of the company reports, you look at any of the academic uh, you know, discussions going on, it's always been attributed to aspects of poverty, low income, lack of education, corruption, illegal mines, a weak regulatory system, inefficient bu bureaucracy, et cetera. And if in it, the model uh, earlier, which I showed about the macro and micro, which was taken by, from Andrew Crane's model, they also talk mostly on those aspects. But what is the real reason behind such negligence and inefficiencies in supply chain that has never been openly discussed? So I just wanted to dwell a bit more into it and what we've, found out and in my research was that so worst forms of child labor definitions currently do not as I said take into consideration aspects such as displacement race caste 
and these kind of related discrimination. And they fail to establish the relationship between work and education, taking these aspects in consideration. One needs to consider that many children miss school often not because of the fact that, you know, the, 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 the parents don't have money to put them into school, uh, or maybe there is a problem with uh, the state there. Uh, so this is uh, something I wanted to share when I was talking to a mother whose child works in the mica mining and I asked her that, why don't you send your child to the school? You know, there's free education. She said, we belong to the very lower caste and my child is not uh, allowed to sit inside the classroom. My child has to sit outside the classroom just because we are untouchables. So it's not just that easy that you have to put these children to school and education is the only way out. So one needs to consider that many children miss school often because of social inequalities and that they're not allowed to attend school because they belong to very low caste. So such race and caste-based social inequalities where are often invisible are yet to be considered in conceptualizing and defining child labor. Most of the existing definitions neglects these terms in defining child labor, nor do they provide any kind of guidance on crucial questions as as to how to assess the risk of child slave labor on incidents related to caste discriminations by organizations. Now we take inspiration here to conceptualize through this theoretical lens of theory of modern slavery and ma as a management practice, which has been developed by Andrew Crane and invisible social inequality literature, which is being still being developed. I think they had a couple of papers by Hari Bapuji, Zesma, Chris Paul, uh, and you know, they have been doing some amount of work here. They have opened up this discussion to examine how organizations succeed in deploying the illegitimate practice of child labor through this process of social inequality. That's a research that has also been done uh, by Amis and, uh, uh, and Mayer and, uh, in 2020. Now, solving social inequality and discrimination, it's a very highly complex process since caste is an institution that is deeply embodied affecting workplaces, having Im implications for institutional work, precarious work, uh, modern slavery, and yet it is difficult to dismantle because of its rooting in its body and the sacred which strips away the agency, as says uh, Chris Paul, Bapuji, and Zesma in the 2020 paper. Now, the implications of their involvement are far more nuanced and complex than international children's rights advocates understand them to be. Cast further complicates the education progress, as we just saw, of children born in lower caste. Expectations from children is not always to read and write and be educated. Children means business here. So evolving academic discussions have centered around the roles that young boys and girls assume in negotiating household poverty and enhancing the livelihood opportunities in small scale mining community. Issues of structural casteism in organization is rapidly gaining momentum, thankfully, globally. So earlier this year, a lawsuit against Cisco, the giant from, uh, you know, the tech giant from California's department, they had a fair employment and housing that was filed by the Ambedkar International Center in the US. It's a, it's a US-based organization raising awareness against caste discrimination and made headline for a seemingly rare case of an employee who was a Dalit, who was being discriminated against by his Brahmins or a dominant caste workplace superior, alleging that the major tech industry employer violated civil uh, rights laws uh, you know, by discriminating against a worker of Indian origin because he was born into a lower caste. So this argument against Cisco is a major milestone in the transnational anti-caste movement. And it makes a claim for caste discrimination under the equal protection laws uh, terms for racial or re religious discrimination, opening the door uh, to interesting comparative analogies and forcing the social and institutional operations of caste out of this invisible shadow. How should organization respond? That's a thing that even I am struggling with. You know, So responses to child labor in the Indian mica mining industry, of course, it should move away from this dominance of due diligence and reporting to a more holistic and incremental approach towards business addressing issues of social inequalities of the dominant caste system across the value chains. 
Uh, some companies have been using IT blockchain technology to tackle these issues. And also what they are doing is they're bringing in more transparency, uh, urging the companies to say that, you know, uh, how, what kind of people are you employing? What costs are they in? So more transparency on that side. Most scholars claim that it has been working in um, African cocoa industry where they have been doing it for race, you know, the, that oh, no discrimination towards race. Uh, you know, some scholars say that it might work in Jharkhand as well. Uh, I'm I'm cautiously uh, skeptical a bit about that. How would it work? But if uh, structural cost is the main issue, then we do urge companies to address the issue of cost and race in the supply chain, which they don't currently do it. You know, and we do think that that's one of the main root causes. And going back to what Dave's paper was, uh, you know, why are they poor? The questions that why do they continue being poor, you know? I mean, generations after generations, they are poor, really? And they just can't climb up that ladder? What is going on there? And it's, it's just this mental conditioning as well going on here. You see that they have been always told that this is your place, this is your dirty job, and you better stay here. Don't ask for anything more. So uh, that that's the bit of a uh, struggle that I'm going through in the paper, that how to position that in my paper. Now, I am going to leave you all with a very powerful quote uh, by B.R. Ambedkar, uh, Indian jurist, economist, politician, and social reformer, who inspired the Dalit movement uh, and campaigned against social discrimination towards the untouchables of Dalits. He said that slavery, it must be admitted, is not a free social order, but can untouchability be described as a free social order? The Hindus who came forward to defend untouchability no doubt claim that that is. They however forget that they are, there are differences between untouchability and slavery, which makes untouchability a worse type of an unfree social order. Slavery was never obligatory, but untouchability is obligatory. A person is permitted to hold another as his slave. There is no compulsion on him if he does not want to, you know but an untouchable has no option. Once he's born an untouchable, he's subject to all the disabilities of an untouchable. Thank you very much. I look forward to your comments. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Shilpi. This is indeed interesting. You know, it's uh, just to add uh, uh, to this for everyone, uh, the effort as you have, you must have gathered by now is to kind of, highlight and bring out the, the deeply embedded and rooted structural inequalities in a society and the relationship with the phenomena, the two phenomena of modern slavery and uh, GVC. Uh, and this is a classic uh, example of an industry, MICA industry, which we are able to look at these issues in a more deeper sense because Traditional, traditional approaches to addressing child labor uh, may also miss out these kinds of structural inequalities. And I think that's, that's why we felt it is important to bring to light and, and, and do some kind of a, from a business and management perspective, being this, this whole project is being interdisciplinary. We thought it might be valuable to put this uh, out there. Uh, or make an effort to at least put it out there. Thank you so much. Uh, open to comments. I think Tamar is going to uh, give us some comments. You need to unmute yourself, Tamar. Thank you uh, very much. As I wrote to you, Bimal and uh, Shilpi, I think it's a, it's a very important paper. Uh, you, you said earlier, Shilpi, that uh, one aim is to establish the, the case of uh, the child slave laborers in the mica industry. And I think as I wrote to you, you make it painfully clear. It's a, it's a difficult paper in terms of reading the, this horrible circumstances and I think it's important for all of us to, to not just to uh, talk about abstract notions and, and analysis. And so thank you for that. Um, I also think that uh, uh, you, you make it clear that this 
the circumstances in the current uh, uh, global order are actually one of the most cruelest outcomes of the governance deficits occurred in recent decades in, in the global corporate, national, and regional levels. And this is at least in part due to the dominance of GVCs. And I do think that you maybe can uh, develop this point a bit further uh, in terms of how uh, it all enhanced uh, by uh, the rise and the dominance of GVCs. Uh, one of the main points you make in the paper is that while the root causes of child labor in the Indian mica industry are the caste system and inequalities, the global discourse on the issue is not sensitive to Indian specific context and to local context in general, which I think is a, is a, is a fair point and important point to make. Uh, you further argue that to effectively tackle child labor in the MICA industry requires addressing Indian historical and social cultural context of caste based social inequality and exploitation. Uh, however, you, you did talk about it, uh, Shilpi, uh, in the presentation, but I think it is less clear what it takes to address the specific Indian context of child labor in the MICA industry. And, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the L'Oreal and the Lush examples, and I think it's, uh, they are both good examples for what uh, Dev talked earlier about the, the demands and supply uh, sides. Um, while L'Oreal uh, explicitly uh, adopts a policy that is aimed at improving the living and working condition of the MICA, uh, dependent local families, Lash's decision to stop sourcing mica from India. Uh, well, it admits that it lacks the purchasing power and local knowledge uh, to stay and make a difference, actually uh, addresses the demand side or the problem of the demand side. Uh, and also, uh, I think that uh, L'Oreal as a founding member of, our, of the RMI is also something that maybe can be more elaborate in the article. And specifically, I think that uh, you, should, you maybe should uh, state a bit clearer what you see as the shortcomings of all these approaches uh, of the RMI, the L'Oreal's, for example, policy, uh, which stresses the supply uh, side and Lash's policy that stresses the demand side. Uh, third point I want, uh, the third point I want to make is that uh, your suggestion that the management studies systematically deny the issue of slavery and particularly of child labor uh, I found it convincing, but maybe should be stated more nuancedly. Specifically, I think that it's important to look at the business and society scholarship and, and analyze its, de its denial because it's more uh, evasive, I think, in this specific scholarship. Uh, also, I, I think the section on the COVID-19 is important and it's very, uh, it, it, I think it's, it's, you can't now write a paper without uh, somehow referring to, to COVID-19 impacts. I, I share with you the understanding that COVID-19 related measures taken by governments and the private sector have put children's well-being at risk and contributed to an increase in child labor. However, I, as I said, I, I, I'm not sure about the optimistic tone you you end this section i i believe that the pan pandemic has only exposed the harsh impacts of gvcs on marginalized po population and, and did not create new ones i think yahel uh, wrote it in the chat earlier today um, and mark annals shows it in his uh, i think 2020 report uh, so i would uh, suggest uh, to to broaden a bit the, the discussion about the effects COVID-19 related measures taken by companies that source MICA, MICA head on uh, child uh, slave labor in the MICA industry. Uh, and, uh, and maybe uh, can, can be more specific about it, uh, specifically because you do want to make the point about the local context. 
uh, a small uh, my last point is uh, is just uh, maybe it's me but i think Chilpi, you you mentioned it also earlier this day i think it's important to to distinguish between uh, the academic discourse and the global and local efforts uh, on the on the ground efforts to address the issue of uh, child labor, and also between the neglect of the issue of child labor on the part on the part of management studies and the blind eye corporations and consumer consumers turn to the issue. Uh, it's important because I found it confusing in the in the paper. Uh, you can you can always say and uh, and uh, I probably agree with it that there isn't really an, a distinction and that the academic world is part of all these efforts. And I agree with you, but just for the uh, analytic discussion, I think it's important to, to maybe make it clear or state it explicitly that you don't differenti differentiate between the, the, the two worlds or other worlds. So that's it. These are my comments. Again, I think it's, most important uh, paper, and uh, I, I I was very moved by it. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, Tamar. Uh, any more comments, questions, thoughts? Yeah, just just one point. I think you have done a great job in bringing caste into the discussion and drawing the parallel between untouchability and slavery. I think it's very important to carry that discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think see, uh, there is a growing scholarship or literature, you know, there are some scholars who have started in the last few years, started looking at caste specifically in the business and management domain and which is encouraging and we have so so basically what's happening here is we are playing with the three set of literature here one is modern slavery gvc and caste mm -hmm. and and then trying to find uh, linkages in terms of or bringing together and find to see how this plays out in this context of industry very unique yes thank you so much uh any 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 other thoughts, anyone, or should we just uh, uh, have a quick open house? Uh, generally, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.